we are going to be talking about lemons today. But before I talk about lemons, um, I want to talk to you about the season that we are in. Um, Y'all, we are in marathon season. There are marathons everywhere. Chip and Joe were having a marathon down in Waco today. Um, I had a friend that ran in the Illinois Marathon yesterday. And is Tori here today? She's probably like resting. Our own Tori Valadez, she ran in the Rebel Marathon from Mount Charleston all the way down to like the Walmart or somewhere around there on Centennial Hills yesterday. Um, hello? No. Um, not a chance. Okay, so I applaud. Anybody in here marathon runners like you have run a marathon or a half marathon? Ah, I see one. I see a few. Okay. Oh, I'm impressed. Guys, I don't even know that I can run a mile, much less 26.2 of them. Definitely not in the desert. I can assure you of that. We actually passed Tori yesterday. We didn't know that we were getting into like going against the grain of the marathon. And I look over and there's Tori and I'm like, ah, it's Tori. She looked good. I would not be looking that good that far. She was close to then. I wouldn't be looking that good that far um, in the end. So one thing that I know about marathon runners that they're really good at, successful ones, because I would be the marathon runner that made it to mile one, and I'd be like, tap out, tap out, I'm done, I'm done, I'm, I'm exhausted. But successful marathon runners that run their 26.2 miles, they are good at endurance, period. They have figured it out. Now, marathon runners, they train, and they train, and they train, and they train. They train in the morning. They train at night. They train in the heat. They train in the rain. Um, they train in the snow if they live in a cold weather environment. They train, they train, they train. And then they go and they run 26.2 miles. And then there's, the, I'm sure, I'm, I don't know, I've never done it, but I've read up on it. They get sore. They get tired. They get fatigued. They need water and they keep going. They might slow down to a walk. I'd be crawling. It doesn't matter. They're still going because they have learned the fine art of endurance. Now, what in the world does this have to do with lemonade today? <laughs> Ashley, the, when life gives you lemons. Okay, our life is like a marathon. It is. It's not a sprint. It's not a 200-meter dash. We're not racing to see who's going to to get across the finish line first, it is a marathon. Sometimes we're going to start, we're going to run. And there's other times that we might be in a crawl. We might slow down to a walk. I can promise you this, there's going to be pain. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be frustration. And there's going to be feelings of, I just want to quit. Tap out. Lemons, lemons lemons. Thank you, Pastor Adam. You could see that I'm going to trip on that, didn't you? That's what I was thinking too, so thank you. Um, now, we've all heard the cute little saying, when life gives you lemons. See, you've all heard it. It's so cute and precious. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And sometimes when we take that on, like, okay, make lemonade out of this, it kind of becomes like this self-reliant, like it relies all on me to take this lemon, this junk, this sour thing that life has handed to me, and it take, it's going to require me to turn this into lemonade. I just need to change my thinking. I need to change what I'm doing. Me, 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 me. Now, the, the saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, it can be really good if we apply it well and we equip ourselves with that because it's not about being self-reliant. Guys, I can't make lemonade out of this. I, I can't do it on my own strength. I don't have it in me. Now, as I was talking to a friend, so I can't take credit for this, she said, when life gives you lemons, you just want to throw them at people. I'm glad that he remembered. I told him I was going to throw that at him. <laughs> You just want to hurl them at somebody or something. You just want to throw it. I don't want this. It's too much. It's too sour. What do I do with this? I do not want it. It's kind of like probably like mile 18 to 20 in a marathon. 
when you hit the wall and you're like, yeah, this is not fun anymore. I don't really know. Again, I've never run a marathon. I did some research. For me, it'd be mile one where I hit that wall and like, I'm done. I'm done. But in my life, some lemons that I have been handed um, that life gave me. Um, when I was in high school and I was dating Brian and I wanted to go to his private Christian college because he was there, my parents said, I see you, Dad. You're going to have to pay for half of that. It's a private school. If you want to go there bad enough, you're going to pay for half of it. Well, I looked and I knew if I got a scholarship for making a certain ACT college entrance exam score, I could get a really good discount off of my tuition. So I took the ACT six times. Six. And I walk into my senior counselor's office and sit down. And she was a Christian, and she looked at me, and she said, Ashley, you missed it by one point on my sixth time. And I felt, now I was a new Christian, and I felt defeated. I felt sad. I felt scared and frustrated. And I definitely didn't go, oh, let me make lemonade out of this. It was great. I felt like a failure. I identified myself with that number six times. And on that sixth and final time, I missed it by one point, And I began to take on, I'm a failure. Now, fast forward years later, Brian and I are ready to buy a house. And we've looked for houses, and, and we had a budget. Um, and in Tennessee, houses are a lot cheaper than they are here. So we were in Tennessee, and we were driving around. We were looking for a house, and we found a house that was a fixer-upper. And we are not Chip and Joe. And we could not fix up things, but we had decided this was the house for us. This house had been on the market forever, and it had lots of rooms, and we knew that we wanted to have lots of children, and so we put an offer in on that house, and I think it was like maybe our seventh or eighth wedding anniversary when we put the offer in on the house, and our realtor came back to us later that night, and they're like, I know it's been sitting on the market forever, but somebody else has put in an offer today as well, and they've put in a higher offer than you, and they got the house. Oh! 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 It felt like defeat when you had gotten yourself to that point and then you were just handed a lemon. I wasn't like, it's okay, we'll just find another house. No, I was mad. <laughs> then there was this season in my life that I had a rubber band today and I forgot it, um, that the Lord was stretching and stretching and stretching me. And I've alluded to this season before, but I think the season lasted 100 years. That's what it felt like. And he was stretching me and he was growing me and it was uncomfortable. I was insecure. I was trying to figure out who I was. I was trying to take all of these pieces of me and deal with the yuck and the mire and wondering how in the world could God love this? And all of my junk. Now that felt like a crate full of lemons that I carried around all the time. And some days it felt like people would just add some on more when I wasn't um, being a good enough people pleaser. They would just, you know, mm -hmm, let's throw some more lemons on there. That didn't feel very good. And let's talk about the season of loss. I see you, those of you that have experienced loss, Brian and I got married when we were babies. I was barely 20 years old. And my mother-in-law and father-in-law and my mom and dad said, do not have children anytime soon. <laughs> yes, okay. So we brought, like Brian and I were doing, like most people do, like the two-year plan, we're gonna have kids. Two years came and went and we were still in school. <laughs> and we weren't ready for children. And then more years came, and then my mother-in-law and father-in-law and my mom and dad were like, um, we're ready for grandbabies. Like, <laughs> they were ready before we were. And so when Brian and I were ready and we started trying, uh, we were naive. Um, we just, it's just going to happen. And it didn't just happen. And then our first pregnancy, oh my goodness, elated. I took 400,000 pregnancy tests, super excited. I remember my father-in-law, Steve, was like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, I have put EPT or whatever that thing is in business forever taking pregnancy tests. <laughs> and then one morning I realized that my body wasn't keeping that baby. And devastation hit the fan. 
And Brian and I experienced our first miscarriage. Um, if you've been there, you know. It's like you might as well have a child in your arms and you have just lost this baby. The Lord gave us G. We love our G. He'll be 12 in June. And then we had another miscarriage after Garrison. And those lemons felt like, oh, God, like you made this body. What's wrong with it? What am I doing wrong that my body can't hold on to a baby? Like Garrison, I just considered him our miracle baby. My doctor did a series of tests on me after that second miscarriage. And in order to get Brody and Warner here, I had to take medicine. I had to take um, an aspirin, baby aspirin, every single day to keep my blood from clotting too much. And so I want to pause right here for a minute because this is something near and dear to my heart. Moms and dads sitting in this room, the people that have wanted a baby so very badly, I see you. I know your pain and I know your hurt, but I also know a God that has got great and mighty plans for you. I don't know if you're going to be somebody's spiritual mom or if you are going to adopt or if one day down the road he's going to bless you with a child of your own. But I have some dear friends in this room that have adopted the most precious baby boy in the entire world. And he looks just like them. And I know that God took him from a really bad situation and he put them with a Christian mom and dad. And it is the most amazing blessing to watch this family and them do life together with the Lord. Okay, guys, so has anybody seen this really awesome and great and wonderful movie called The Lord of the Rings? Okay, okay. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I'm totally using The Lord of the Rings right now. Email Brian. He can handle it if you don't like it. Okay. <laughs> I never saw The Lord of the Rings until we moved to Vegas. And if you've seen the movie, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm Frodo. I'm Frodo, and I do not want this ring. I do not want this ring. No. Okay, so can we put this? It's on the screen. Let's put this up here. Okay, so Gandalf, if you haven't seen it, go watch it this weekend. Okay, Gandalf is talking to Frodo, and he's just kind of reminding Frodo that in dark times, everybody has a choice. We have dark times. We live on planet Earth. It happens. Frodo tells um, Gandalf, he says, he says this, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had ever happened. Hello. When I had those miscarriages, I said, I wish this had never happened. I, I, wish, I just hope I wake up in the morning and it's all a really bad dream. When we got the rejection on the house, I'm like, please, let this just be a bad dream. The six ACT tests, and I don't get a scholarship to school. Please just let this be a nightmare, and I'm going to wake up, and it's going to be fine. That season of, like, waking up and being stretched and just being insecure, and who am I in Christ? I don't like this. This is not like running through a field of daisies and frolicking with unicorns, and there's butterflies all flying around. Like, what is this Christian life? This is not easy. Please let this just be a dream. And Gandalf, the movie parallels so much of Christ. Gandalf says this. He says to Frodo, So do all who live to see such times. But that's not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. So Brian says this all the time. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Um, um, you're going to have bad times. We live in a broken world. There's sin all around us. It is what it is. And we can wish all day long, but wishing's not going to get us anywhere. We got to decide what we're going to do with these lemons that we have been handed. So what are the lemons that you have been handed? I shared some of you, mine today, but maybe some of your lemons are mm, infertility. Maybe you've got parenting woes. Hello, I'm parenting a preteen for the first time. I don't know what that's all about. I'm like, where's that precious little boy? 
And girls too. I hear it. I hear it. I, I, I hear you. I hear you. I have to remind myself because during that time of, I just want, I remember sitting in my car and I would look in the rear view mirror at an empty back seat and I wanted nothing more than just to see a baby in a car seat back there. Nothing more than that. And I have to remind myself of that when Garrison is driving me crazy. I love him. Okay. <laughs> Whose parents had preteens? I need, I need you. I need you. Okay, another lemon. Finances. Another lemon maybe you're carrying is job loss. Maybe you're hauling around the lemon of, I'm stuck spiritually. I don't know what to do. This doesn't feel right. Maybe you're lugging around the lemon of a struggling marriage. How do I handle this and how do I fix it? Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you are dealing with some sort of illness. Maybe it's a life-threatening one. It's one that just totally rocks your entire day. Maybe you're, you've got an addiction. And likely it's a secret addiction that nobody knows about. And you're like, ah, what do I do with this lemon? I can't get out of it. It's got a grip on you. Well, those of you that have been around here long enough, you know what I'm going to say. I don't have advice for you other than we're going to go to the Word of God. So let's open the book of James. If you've got it on in your Bible, if you have got it on your phone, you can turn your phones on. Um, it'll be up on the screen as well. James 1, verses 1 and 2. James is the half-brother of Jesus. And this is so cool because this is how James introduces himself. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I have three boys. Not a single one of them is going to be like, I'm Brody, brother of Garrison. <laughs> not happening. I just love James's humility here. He, he doesn't even say, hey, I'm, I'm the brother of Jesus. Like, I'm the brother of Jesus. I'm the brother of the man. No, he is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus. And he's speaking to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And he says, greetings. Oh, yeah. A letter of encouragement. Oh, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Oh, it's like Pastor B up here saying, you love me, don't you? And aren't you glad you came to church? And here's a message of encouragement to you today. I need you to consider it pure joy. I mean, hold the door, friends, because I don't consider any kind of trial pure joy. My flesh is like, no. And I'll take a hard pass on that one. Next. And he also says, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Not when, I mean, not if, but when. And trials of how many kinds? One kind? Many kinds. Thank you. Whew. Let's take a closer look. Because he's got to have some, something more for us. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because... You know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Okay, let's break it down a little bit. He's writing to brothers and sisters, so he is writing to believers. He is encouraging believers, and he's telling them, you're going to have trials, and you're going to have troubles, and I'm going to help you for when you do have them, because he says, when, not if. James is saying there is a purpose in the trial, and the purpose is to grow you, and the result is perseverance. And I love um, learning about the words in the Bible and digging deeper. And so I went to the Greek, and I really did go to the Greek for the word perseverance. And this is on the screen. Perseverance in the Greek is hupomone. Okay, everybody together now, hupomone. That was good. A little bit. Okay, let's do it again. Hupomone. Very good. You're speaking Greek. It sounds like Greek to me. Okay, so here's what hupomone means. It is a patient continuance, a steadfastness. That's Brian's favorite word for me. 
It was like my family, my maiden name is Mansfield, and like on my family crest, it said steadfast, which means stubborn. Um, So, hupomone, patient continuance, steadfastness, and endurance. A characteristic of a believer who is persevering is someone who is not derailed. They're not derailed when the lemons come their way. They're not derailed by life circumstances. They're, they're not derailed from their purpose. I have a purpose here. Throw all the lemons at me. I'm going to give them to Jesus, but I got a purpose here, and it's not going to derail me. Now, I'm not going to lie. There are times where I'm like, mm, I'm going to wave the white flag on this one. I do not like this, and I want to pass it off. I wish it had never happened. I got a choice. I have something to do with it. Stay loyal to your faith. Hupomone, perseverance, also means, consider it like this. It's, like a, um, it's not like a passive waiting, like you go to a doctor's office and you're waiting in the um, waiting room, um, which some of us can't even do well. Yikes, right? But hupomone, perseverance, is like what it's like to run a marathon. It's the remaining in it. It's not the sitting there and patiently waiting for something to happen. It's to, it's to remain. It's to remain in something. Hupomone comes from two words. Hupo, which means under. Mino, which means to stay, abide, to remain. And so when you put them together, hupomone means to remain under. And just visualize this, if you will. It's like somebody under a heavy weight, and they choose to stay there instead of trying to escape. So when you read perseverance and endurance in the Bible, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about remaining under whatever it is and not just trying to escape to make things more lovely for you. Because we all want to be comfortable. But sometimes we're put in situations where we're not comfortable and we're under this heavy weight. And I have a a sweet friend who described it this way. It's called, um, she said, it's like suffering well. Like you're suffering, but you're suffering well because under all of that, you're saying the only way that I'm able to stay under this heavy weight right now and the only reason I'm not escaping is because of Jesus. And he's going to get me through and he's going to do something with this heavy weight that is on me. When your faith is put to the test, if you receive it with joy and purpose, it results in you growing in endurance and steadfastness. Let's keep looking in James. James 1, 4 says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And I want you to look at the word let. I didn't go to the Greek for let. Let means let. That's what it means. Let means let. It means to allow. It means do not stop it. Let perseverance. Let endurance Let the remaining under work in you. Don't get ahead of it. Let it work in you. Don't whine about it. I tend to do that. Oh, I don't like this, and I whine about it. But let it have its purpose. God, I don't like this. I don't like that we got rejected for this house, but what is your plan for me? Lord, my heart is hurting because I've lost another baby. But you are good, and I know you're good. What is your plan for me? Let it work in you so that, everybody say so that. that. Oh, that was good. So that you may be mature. So that you may be complete. So that you're not going to lack anything. There is a result to your perseverance. You will be complete, you will be mature, and you will grow. But you got to remain under. Because if you just try to escape, and likely if you're escaping what God is allowing you to go through, you're escaping to some really dangerous places. And those dangerous places are probably going to get you in trouble. But if you remain under God's goodness and under what he's growing in you, the next time you walk a hard road, it's not going to be that bad. Who likes 
likes working out in here? Oh, some of you. Okay, good. <laughs> Who doesn't like working out in here? <laughs> Me either. But when we work out and we go for it, you get stronger. And that workout that was once really brutal wasn't that bad. Next time. And it's the same way with exercising our faith. The first time we exercise our faith, oh, we want to see results immediately. I'm sorry. You don't go to the gym and like all of a sudden become like a size two. It takes time. The same thing with exercising your faith. But you get stronger and stronger and stronger. Guys, there are things I go through now that used to send me to a fetal position in the back corner of my room. And I cry for hours and hours and hours. But God, because he allowed me. And I stayed under, I remained under, and I, there were lots of tears, oceans of them, but I never left him, and he never leaves me. And he has grown me. Paul talks about this in Romans, Romans 5, 3 through 4. It's on the screen. It says this, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Hello. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Produce it, per perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Look at it this way. This is also on the screen. You've got your sufferings, which is, those are your trials. And you go through those, and you learn to remain under, and this is your perseverance. And then that perseverance, the experience, develops character in you. And the character that it produces hope. And your hope is in the Lord Jesus. And every time you go through something, your hope in him increases. Because you see that he never fails you. And he's always going to be there. He may not be there. Like when you think he needs to be there, he's there, by the way. He's always there. But he may not be answering the way that you think he should answer. But I can assure you, it's better him being God than you being God. Because we would have messed this up a long time ago. We should not despise our trials. We should embrace them and allow God to produce perseverance, character, and hope in us. Your lemons can bring glory and honor to God as he transforms them into that sweet lemonade. And Peter adds this in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. It's also on the screen. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which even though it is refined by fire, it's going to perish, your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed People are watching your life. They're watching, especially if they know you're a Christian. Amen. They're watching. There's something different about you. Yeah. And you know what? You may mess up. But as a Christian, when we mess up, we come back and we say, you know, I was in the wrong. I was in the wrong. Maybe like, you lose your mind on people at the workplace and then you apologize to them. People don't do that. If you're walking with Jesus, you do that because you make right your wrongs. People are watching that. And then they're like, there's something different about them. Or maybe you've walked through one of these really ugly, ugly roads. Maybe you've got this lemon and people are watching you. Your neighbors are watching. And they say, how, how is he handling that so well? Like, I would fall apart People are watching you. And it's not you that they ultimately see. It's Jesus in you that they see. And then they're like, um, I really want whatever they've got. may not happen today, but they keep watching your life. They're going to come knocking on your door when life throws them a bunch of lemons that they don't know how to handle. May our lives, the good and the bad and the ugly, may all of it always point people always point people to Jesus. May we suffer well. May our faith be proved genuine. Let's look at James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should 
Ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. This is, what, this is your part. This is what you do. God, I don't know what to do with this lemon. You ask him and you talk to him. And let me tell you, we had this great conversation with some friends yesterday. When you are talking with God, you talk to him like a friend. Hi, I'm Ashley. I don't know you, but it's nice to meet you today. Okay, you're going to be my friend. You just talk like this. You know what? Today was poopy. I did not like today. I did not like what life had to hand me today. You talk to God like you talk to a friend. He can handle it. He can handle your authenticity. He doesn't need you to say, oh, God, thou father, thy thee. He doesn't need that. He needs you to be real and honest with him. But also don't forget that he is good. You need to tell him how good he is. All the time. I love y'all. God also, he likes for us to come to him, even if we've got a stinky past. Even if we're in a stinky situation right now. You come to him. He wants you to. You don't need to like, like do Hail Marys and all kind of stuff to come to him. I don't even know. You come to him with your junk. And you come to him being real, and you can come to him persistent. My children mom the mess out of me. Mom, 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 mom. I'm not even kidding. Mom, 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 mom. I saw a mug for Mother's Day with mom, 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 mom all over it. I don't even want it because I hear it enough. Sometimes I like drown it out and it annoys everyone else around me because they're hearing it for the first time. You know what? God is referred to as our father. In the Bible, he's referred to as Abba Father. We can Abba the mess out of him and he loves it. Abba, 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 Abba. He loves it. He wants relationship. He wants you to come to him. And he wants you to be raw and real and authentic with him. You don't have to make your life right before you come to him. Your life gets made right after you come to him. Let's look at James 1, 6 through 7. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. We love when Warner asks this. Well, I got a question for you, but I know what you're already going to say. Don't we do that with God? God, if you want to, I really want you to take this lemon and make it lemonade if it's okay with you. Just talk to him and believe that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. His word is yes and amen. He's not going to abandon you. He can handle it. Come to him and tell him. Now, if you're telling him what you need and it does not align biblically, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's probably not going to happen. It needs to align with this. Pray the Bible. I don't know how to pray the Bible. Read the Bible. Pray it while you read it. It's that easy. And tell God, you know what? God, you said this. You said it. You said it. I believe it. You said it. Ask for wisdom with confidence and stay in faith and watch God work. Let's look at James 1.12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. You remain and you stay. Great is your reward. So the way I see it, you've got two choices. You can resist the lemons and you can miss out. Because if you want to resist this and you just want to hurl them back, you're never going to see what's made from the other side of that. One of my friends said that Chick-fil-A lemonade is the best lemonade. And I say, hallelujah. Yes, it is. Chick-fil-A lemonade. Cane's is really good, too. Okay. It's good lemonade. It's good. This, if I just cut it open right now and take a bite in there, that is nasty. That is gross. You throw some water and sugar in there. 
and it's freshly squeezed, yes, that's some good lemonade. If I just hurl this back, I'm never going to taste that delicious lemonade. If I just say, God, I don't want it. I don't want it. I'm never going to see what could have been if I had just remained under and I stayed with him and I trusted him to work it all out. Or option two is you can embrace the squeeze. You can allow that lemon to be squeezed in your life. You can allow the Lord to form and shape and mold and do what he's doing in you while you remain under. And then you're going to see that he works all things together for your good because you love him and you're called according to his purposes. But you got to stay. So according to James, we should do four things when we experience trials in our lives. On your fun little notes, you can write these down. Brian told me, he was like, slow down, you talk so fast. Slow down. He's so good. He's the best coach ever. I love him. The first thing is you can recognize what's really going on. You can recognize that the lemon that you've been handed has a purpose and that God is working. Brian and I have some friends in Tennessee, and we've talked about their story a little bit before, but um, they have three children, and their middle child, she was awesome. Oh, my goodness, that girl was so sweet, and she would work in the church nursery, and she loved my boys, and her name was Katie Beth. And Katie Beth had, she went through some, she went through some poop in middle school and high school. I'm sorry. That's just the word for it. She went through it. But her faith in Jesus never wavered as a teenager, which is amazing. And she still served him, and she still just spread the light of Jesus. And she experienced lots of defeat and failure. She loved to dance. She danced all of her life, and she didn't make a certain dance team and a school dance team. And that's hard when you get that rejection, Guys, I tried out for wrestling, cheerleading. That is where you sit on the floor and bang on a mat. That's it. And I didn't even make that, and that rejection was hard enough. I didn't train for that my entire life. <laughs> this young lady trained her entire life for dance, and she couldn't even make the school dance team. But she got accepted to a college, and um, she made their elite dance team. Um, they were called the Marching Ballerinas. And she, the college was like two hours away from home, and she had practiced with them all summer. Um, and college had began. She um, danced at her first football game. It was the Saturday before Labor Day. And then she came home for Labor Day weekend. And on Labor Day, she drove back to school. And 10 minutes away from her school, she got in a horrible car accident and lost her life. And I will never forget that Labor Day, sitting in our bed, and Brian gasped because he was on social media. And he said, Katie Beth died today. And I just felt like the heaviness of the world on me. And I, parents love their babies. And my heart just instantly went out to her parents. And we prayed for them, and Brian shared even, I think, then here at church. But Jason and Amy, they had, they had two decisions. They could hurl that nasty lemon back, and they could have walked away from the Lord. Jesus, how could you take our daughter? We go through that? They could have walked away, but they chose to embrace the squeeze. And when we went back to Tennessee in November, I got to hug their necks for the first time in forever. And I told them, I love you. And watching you glorify God through the nastiest trial of your life has been beautiful. Yesterday would have been Katie Beth's 21st birthday. And instead of just wallowing in their misery, which they have every right to do, they chose Jesus. They've written this amazing book called Oaks and Ruins, Letting God Redeem Your Loss. 
If you feel like this is something you need, get with me, and I will make sure that you get one. But they've made an entire ministry out of their grief and their pain. The school football team of the high school that Katie Beth went to school with, the entire team got baptized on school property of a public school because Katie Beth's life pointed them to Jesus. So many people have come to know Jesus through the life of a young lady who all she did is she lived her life well. She ran the race and she persevered. Even even through hard times for herself, she still reflected Jesus. And there are people still to this day that are coming to know him. Because her legacy lives on and her parents say, you know what? I'm going to recognize what's really going on. We live in a broken world. We're not promised tomorrow. None of us are. And her mom wrote yesterday. They had 18 years with her. And her mom wrote yesterday on social media. It's so good to know that heaven is a lot longer than 18 years. Now that is taking a lemon and making the best lemonade out of it. They couldn't do it on their own. The only way that that family has been able to go on is because of Jesus. Number two is cooperate with God's growth process. If you don't cooperate, it's not going to work. <laughs> I have three children. When they do not cooperate, it does not work, and it gets ugly really fast. When they cooperate, everything is just great. Boys, clean, do your chores. If they cooperate immediately, they have a lot more fun in their day. If they do not cooperate immediately, you know. Mama, mama, ain't, mama ain't happy. Okay. <laughs> cooperate with God's growth process. It'll get you where you want to be a lot faster if you'll just cooperate. Let it work. Let it do its thing in you. Number three is ask for God's help. Seek his wisdom. If you just like lay there with the Bible on you, you're like, impart in me. It's not going to happen. You have to do the work and you have to go to him. And if you want to hear God, open this. This is how he speaks to you. But if it's got a few layers of dust on the side table over there, he's not saying too much to you. You have to put action to it. And number four is keep a consistent, faith-filled attitude. Persevere. You may have some times where you fall down and you're like, oh, don't beat yourself up. God's grace is for you. God gives us more grace than we ever give ourselves. And when you don't give yourself grace, you're undermining what he did for you. His grace is free for you. If you fall down, just get back up again. Start somewhere. Jesus is our best example of embracing the squeeze. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Listen to this. For the joy set before him, Jesus himself endured. Hupamone. He persevered. He remained under the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down on the right hand. At the right hand of the Father, he endured the cross. He knows what it's like to remain under. Imagine the difference these truths would make in your life. God made lemonade for me in that he developed an awesome work perseverance in me. I got to college and I didn't give up because I didn't get that scholarship Now I wanted a scholarship of a certain GPA. And semester after semester after semester, I was missing that certain GPA by small little percentages. And Brian saw me. I would cry, but I would pray, and I would say, Jesus. And I ended up getting that scholarship that I wanted because of him. 
And I was the first person in both sides of my family to graduate college. And I graduated with a magna cum laude degree, degree not, because, not because of me, but because of him. And because what he did in me and through me. And I made amazing friends in college. And I've seen him take care of me financially. Brian and I, one day, we were just driving around, and we stumbled into this cute little neighborhood, and it just had, like, the most beautiful craftsman-style houses, and I'm drooling, and I'm like, that's what I want. But it felt so out of reach, but it's exactly what God gave us. And we moved into a house that had a basement, and little did we know that all of a sudden, like, the south would become Tornado Alley, and we would go through so many tornado warnings in that basement, and we always felt safe and secure, and God had put us in just the right place, and we made amazing friends, and it was awesome. Now I look in my rearview mirror, and I see three children. Most of the time, they're fighting, but I'm grateful that I see three children back there. And he also gave me this love and sensitivity toward people who are walking in infertility. And he's given me this passion to pray for them. That honestly, I would not have ever had had I not walked through it because I I wouldn't know what it was like. And in my season of stretching, where I felt like I bled all over everybody all the time, crying to my friends and my, in my life group, and like, what is the Lord doing with me? I learned who I was in Christ. It took me carrying around that crate of lemons to learn who I was in Christ. I am his, I am royalty, and guess what? There is nothing that I can do to cause him to love me more. Same goes for you. If you read your Bible four hours a day, he is not going to love you more than he does right now. And there is nothing that you can do, no sin that you can commit, no way that you can fail that's going to cause him to love you less than he does right now. And in that season of growing and stretching and carrying around those lemons, I learned that. And I got it. And I learned this is not a religion with the Lord. This is a relationship, and he loves me for me. I don't have to perform for him. He's not going to reject me if I say, no, I don't want to read the Bible today. He's just going to keep spurring me along, and he's going to keep challenging me, and that's okay. So when trials come, we could just quit. We could get mad. We could hurl the lemons at our husbands, or we could choose to remain and let God grow grow us. Each trial will make us stronger in our faith. And over time, things that would have sent you to a fetal position before no longer do. Because you say, but God. He is for me and he is not against me. We persevere through tough stuff. And with his help and his hope, on the other side of it, we're stronger, we're more mature, and we're complete. It may hurt along the way. The race is long. You're probably going to be tired. It's going to be hard, and you want to bail out. But I can assure you that at that finish line, it is oh so worth it. I would like to invite the band to come back up here. If that's what we're doing. Is that what we're doing? Okay. Sorry, y'all. Can I be real? Um, But I just, I want to give you an opportunity That if you do not know Jesus and you have found yourself in this room today and you're like, I know all about lemons. Like that girl, that made complete sense to me. Like my life is full of lemons. I just want to give you the opportunity. We don't ever want to let people not have this chance to come to know him today. So I just invite everybody to close your eyes. And I would like everyone to pray this with me. But if you know in your heart, like I'm at that point and I've got something's got to give. And this Jesus that you're talking about, he, I want that. I want that salvation. I want to know that I have an eternity and I have a hope just like Katie Beth. I want to know that he's going to help me carry these lemons and make them into lemonade. So just pray this after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you for taking my sin, my junk, 
upon yourself and giving me a life of freedom and salvation. I am a sinner. But Lord, I want to be yours. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And I will walk with you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. If that is you, I just want to welcome you to the family today. The family of believers.